Hey everyone, Harris O'Malley from DrNerdLove.com. So, last week we touched on a brief controversy about how people on Instagram and Twitter were body shaming Jason Moa for basically being off the clock and not looking like he's carved from marble and abs at all times. Let's face it, I think we can all agree that if we looked like that, we wouldn't even own shirts. And honestly, why are we talking about him having a slightly less visible six pack and not the fact that he kind of looks like a doof without his beard? Beards. They're like push-up bras for men. But the body shaming comments about men is something that we're seeing more and more of lately, especially with the current popularity of superhero movies and TV shows, not to mention the trend of formerly chubby comedic actors who are getting stupid jacked for action roles and then getting on for eating rolls. I feel like I need to make some sort of bread tube joke here. Actors like Chris Pratt or Hugh Jackman are getting the same, ooh, someone had too many slices of pizza, huh, treatment from the various tabloids that female celebrities have been getting since forever. And that's bad enough, but when a guy who's still in absurdly good shape is getting talked for not having more cuts than a Michael Bay movie, then it drives home an increasingly common issue. The idea of what does a real man look like? This isn't really an idle question. Men feel an increasing amount of pressure to look a particular way, and that pressure is damaging to a lot of people. According to a poll by 538, over 50% of men worry about their weight on a daily basis, while a full third are concerned with their physique. Meanwhile, eating disorders and body dysmorphic disorders are rising among men at an insane rate, with a nearly 70% increase in disordered eating between 2010 and 2016. There's a bitter irony to the fact that men are increasingly experiencing the same pressures to conform to certain literally impossible ideals as women and they're breaking themselves physically and psychically to try to reach them. <sighs> Welcome to the beauty myth, boys. Hope you survived the experience. The idea of what does a real man look like is a surprisingly complex issue because the concept of what a real man and an ideal body is has always been in flux and it has far more to do with fashion and class issues than biology or even sexual desire. We tend to misunderstand where this pressure to look a certain way comes from. It's very easy to put the blame on women, and in fact, we see that happen all the time. The incel community is very quick to insist that women only want men with certain bodies and certain faces. The red pill community, on the other hand, talks about getting ripped to be sufficiently alpha because being jacks supposedly hits the evolutionary triggers in women's brains. And even wags like P.J. O'Rourke used to comment that no women dreams about being thrown on the bed and ravished by someone who looks like a liberal. Then again, nobody was really dreaming about being ravished by P.J. O'Rourke either, so take that as you will. The truth of the matter is that culture and class have far more of an influence on what we think is the ideal man or desirable physique, certainly far more than what we ascribe to biology or evolutionary psychology. If it were were simply about this body signals that you have superior genes, then there would be a pretty distinct lack of variation in humans. Instead, all you have to do is look at the difference between the San people of Botswana and Namibia and the Inuit and Yupik people in Alaska and Canada and Greenland. It also ignores the fact that humans don't have sex exclusively for reproduction. We're one of only three mammals that has sex for pleasure and for social bonding. The idea of what men were supposed to look like has varied drastically over generations and over civilizations. The Greeks of the classical era idealized specific bodily proportions, while the Romans saw the larger muscular bodies of the Germanic tribes as sign of their inferiority. In many cultures, including Europe and America in the 1800s, high levels of body fat was seen as desirable because of the general scarcity of food. In the US in particular, being fat was a sign of class and status status because it meant that you had easy access to food and you weren't having to do manual labor like most of the rest of the population. Once food became more readily accessible and more people started working corporate or clerical jobs that kept us primarily at desks and indoors, the class indicators switched. Being thin and tanned became the indicators of status because now you're showing that you have time to lounge around in the sun and to focus on exercise and what you eat instead of having to base your life around your 
your job. In the 1960s, the countercultural revolution meant that people decided they were going to rebel against everything, including gender norms. Men and women both began to experiment with things like androgyny, going for almost gaunt bodies and more feminine builds, just like the ones they saw in their rock and roll idols. Admittedly, with a little help from cheap and readily available heroin. Meanwhile, in the 80s, Arnold Schwarzenegger made bodybuilding cool and suddenly Everybody wanted to be huge, with bulging, veiny biceps and chiseled chests. While the popularity of the current ideal, a leaner but still muscular body, can be traced to things like the Mark Wahlberg Calvin Klein ads. And, well... I felt sorry for guys packed into gyms, trying to look like how Calvin Klein or Tommy Hilfiger said they should. Is that what a man looks like? <laughs> yep. Fight Club. Welcome to Fightcast, where we do nothing but talk about Fight Club. Seriously, I know I bring Fight Club up all the goddamn time, but it's kind of hard not to when it's constantly relevant. I'd bring up The Matrix more, especially to talk about how men's rights yahoos not only try to ignore the fact that the red pill is a metaphor created by two trans women to describe a multiracial man's realization that he's being exploited by a faceless system that only cares to use and discard him, but also, the fact that the red pill is actually a trap, a distraction designed by the very system they thought to escape, and that taking the red pill means that they have played right into the hands of their unseen masters. People who've taken the red pill have been duped into believing they found forbidden enlightenment when, in reality, they are still just continuing to be a cog in the very system that they thought that they were rebelling against. But some people get uncomfortable when I bring that up. Don't know why. What's interesting here is that Fight Club ends up having it both ways. Ed Norton's character brings up how much the ideal body is literally Literally marketed to men. Is that what a man looks like? <laughs> but he's saying it to a dude who looks like Brad Pitt. And like literally everything else in the movie, people miss the point. People look at Brad Pitt in Fight Club and assume that yes, they too are supposed to look like this. For all that intellectually we understand that Tyler Durden doesn't exist, we forget that the whole point of his character is that he quite literally personifies a near impossible ideal. He is a fantasy figure, the manifestation of Ed Norton's frustrations. He represents someone who we are told to aspire to look like, even though we know that we can't. All the ways you wish you could be, that's me. I look like you wanna look, I like you wanna I am smart, capable, and most importantly, I'm free in all the ways that you are not. Much like people who look at statues of Greek heroes and gods and call these idealized human forms, they're forgetting that these are not people, they're ideals. They're gods, not humans. They have been sculpted to emphasize their impossible perfection. Comparing yourself to statues of Zeus or Apollo or Hercules is like comparing yourself to a Jim Lee drawing of Superman and wondering why you don't measure up. Even when we look at people, not statues or art, but real people, we tend to assume that we are supposed to look like the most exceptional versions, forgetting that the whole point of being exceptional is that they're an exception, not the standard. It's literally impossible for everyone to be exceptional by definition. Instead, we assume that this is how you're supposed to look and we break ourselves into pieces trying to achieve it. To make matters worse, how you're supposed to look is a moving target at best that just keeps getting more and more extreme. When Hugh Jackman debuted as Wolverine in the first X-Men movie, he's shown as being very in shape, but with a relatively realistic build. By 2014, the same actor playing the same character has gone from something plausible, a person you might reasonably see at Starbucks, to a man who looks like he's been made out of stacks of bacon. And men increasingly try to match these looks, whether it's Chris Evans as an inverted Dorito as Captain America, or athletes like Cristiano Ronaldo, as though either was realistic or attainable for 99% of the population. What we so rarely realize is just how little of that is real. Most of the builds we see, whether it's in movies, televisions, or ads, 
don't actually look like that when the camera stops shooting. When we see Stephen Amell with his shirt off and arrow, that's not how he looks 24-7, 365. That is the result of more than half of a year of doing little else but working out, followed by weeks of a zero-carb diet and intense dehydration on the day of shooting. And even then, he doesn't look as carved from marble as he does on our screen until everything has been supplemented by makeup and favorable lighting. In print ads, it goes even further as Photoshop utterly transforms people into impossible figures, leaving the rest of us feeling like unfuckable homunculi. And the constant marketing of these builds teaches us that this is what strength looks like, when in reality, it's nothing of the sort. When Jason Momoa is in Aquaman or Cal Drogo shape, he's actually at his weakest because of the deprivation, the lack of food, the lack of water. Men who are incredibly strong don't look like that. They look like this. And let's be real, we're not seeing Julius Hofthor on billboards in his underwear anytime soon. But moreover, we're also deluded into thinking that these looks are at all attainable by the average man. While Christian Ronaldo is unquestionably a hot piece of ass with abs like whoa, he's also a professional athlete whose entire career is based around being able to perform very specific tasks. His job is literally to be in that shape. But even putting models and actors and athletes aside, the process of trying to look like Tyler Durden is functionally out of the reach of most people just through the sheer logistics of a day-to-day -day life. In his article, The Rise and Rise of the Spornosexual, author Max Lesker works with a celebrity trainer in an attempt to get that ideal body, and it quickly becomes the only thing he can do. His entire life becomes about shuffling between the gym and work and back to the gym again, while trying to keep to an absurdly rigid meal schedule that has him eating six times a day. He is constantly exhausted, constantly in pain, and trying to reassure himself that it's all going to be worth it in the end for the admittedly brief window that he's going to have that body. And as a complete aside, I would really love to see a follow-up about how long he was able to follow that routine before giving it up and going back to something that could actually be maintained by an average person. Just as important, though, is that you can do all the dieting that you want. You can copy Tom Ellis's workouts to the very minute and pound and not get the same results. Your individual build and genetics are going to determine your shape and musculature far more than any amount of clean eating and exercise. I mean... I work out hard, I pay attention to my diet, but no amount of weights, cardio, diet, Pilates, fat ripping supplements, or literally anything else is going to give me David Beckham's body because none of that is going to change the shape of my rib cage. As much as I would love to have a build like Jude Laws and the talented Mr. Ripley, I'm built like the mountain, just shorter, which I guess makes me the molehill. And yet a lot of people haven't gotten to that place of acceptance. So instead they end up starving themselves and working out so hard they destroy their knees, their joints and their kidneys, all the while buying into and promoting a narrative that pain is noble, deprivation is a virtue and that pleasure is ultimately bad. Hey, there's that red pill again. Weird how that works. Meanwhile, we're all choking down the message that if you don't look like this, you're worthless and worth less. We're being sold the same self-loathing that gets sold to women just dressed up in manly drag and reinforced by media that shames even the most ripped among us with, whoa, what happened features instead of accepting that sometimes you just want to eat some tacos. Now, when we talk about body image and body types, a lot of folks will point out that women are attracted to guys who look like that. And you know, that's fair. That's legit. You really don't have to look very hard to find women who are going to be drooling all over the Marvel Chrises. But it isn't women who are pushing these looks or telling men that this is what they need to look like. It's other men. Men are the ones selling these bodies as aspirational figures, not as look like this and be desired by women, but look like this and be revered as a powerful god. I mean, if you need to see this in action, all you have to do is look at the way that Hugh Jackman is portrayed on magazines aimed at men versus the way that he's portrayed on magazines aimed at women. Don't get me wrong. I am not saying that women don't think those guys aren't as hot as a five alarm fire. 
But while women definitely respond to, say, Brendan Fraser in George of the Jungle, that's not the only body type they're into. In reality, women dig a wide range of bodies, from the supercut athletes to softer guys like Kristen Brune or dad bods like David Harbour has in Stranger Things, to straight, thick dudes like Prince Fielder. In fact, I asked women on Twitter and the Dr. Nerd Love Facebook page about their first fictional crushes, the one that ultimately set their type for them. And the results are interesting because it's usually not who you think it would be. Unless you think it's the fox from Robin Hood, in which case, no, it's exactly who you think it would be. But it's worth your pausing this episode and going to check it out, especially because we're gonna be talking about all of that in an upcoming episode. Now, if you ask guys about why they want those bodies and you really dig down into the responses, a lot of what they ultimately want is validation. A lot of men feel invisible, unnoticeable. We want to feel like we are attractive, regardless of whether we are in whatever is the perfect shape or not. This actually comes up a lot, especially among men who are frustrated by the fact that they don't and often can't conform to those ideals, whether they're too short, too fat, or too skinny. In fact, you'll hear from guys who want to know why there's not a body positivity movement for men the way there is for women. And first of all, there is, you're just not aware of it. But more to the point is the fact that what a lot of folks are asking for when they ask about male body positivity is for women to be leading the charge. Because one of the tragedies about the toxic forms of modern masculinity is that we are taught that men can only get validation from people we might want to sleep with. It's another example of how we've equated vulnerability with weakness, emotional intimacy with sexual intimacy, and the idea that emotional expression and support is somehow feminizing. And since real men are supposed to avoid anything feminine, we have taught ourselves that validation about how we look only counts if it comes from women. We have cut ourselves off from getting support from half the population on earth because we're afraid of being called fags for asking for it or for giving it. I mean, it's kind of telling that half of what Jonathan Van Ness and Tan France do on Queer Eye is let guys believe for the first time ever that they're actually attractive. And it's even more telling that men are more willing to seek that validation from an effeminate gay man and a person who actively chooses to f with the gender binary than, say, The Rock. The truth is that if you look at the body positivity movement for women, it's being led by women for women. It's not being done for male approval. It's not about telling men that they need to be attracted to certain body types. It's about women learning to be comfortable in their own skin and learning to love their bodies no matter what they look like. And female friendships in general are much more supportive and expressive about giving validation to one another, telling each other that they look great and why. Guys, don't do that. If we want to have a body positivity movement for men, then it can't be about getting validation from women. It has to be about us validating one another. Men being supportive of other men and saying that these bodies are all valid and all awesome. Because the idea of what a real man looks like is less about trying to live up to a bullshit ideal and more about learning to love ourselves. We need that validation and we need to be the ones to give it to one another. Because it is hard out there for men. It is hard for us to believe in our own value, in our own validity, and in our own desirability or attractiveness, especially when perfect bodies are being sold to us as a product. The hardest truth to accept is that if you want to see what a real man looks like, all you have to do is look in the mirror. Thanks for watching my video. You've heard from me, so now I want to hear from you. So I asked people on Twitter and Facebook to talk about their first fictional crushes, so I want to hear about yours. 
who was the first fictional character that ultimately set the standard for the people that you're attracted to now? Share your story in the comments below. Meanwhile, if you want to get a start on grinding out those social skills and learning how to be the sexy badass that you know you can be, then check out my book, New Game Plus, The Geek's Guide to Love, Sex, and Dating. This is the A to Z instruction manual that teaches you everything you've always wanted to know about how to get better at dating, but we're afraid to ask. Links to buy it are in the show notes, so go check it out. And if you do check it out, or any of my other books for that matter, do me a huge favor and be sure to rate and review it on Amazon and Goodreads. It's a big, big help. If you're digging the series, you know what to do. You've been here before. Hit the thumbs up, share it around with all your friends, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, you know how this all works. But if you are really enjoying these videos, and I mean really enjoying them, if you feel like you're getting a lot out of them and you're finding that it's really helping you and you want to support the channel and in the process, help fund some really awesome new projects, then consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash drnerdlove. Even $1 is a huge help, but at $3 a month or more, you get access to some awesome patron-only content. Meanwhile, follow me on Twitter at, at DrNerdLove. Join the Facebook page to keep up with all the latest news at facebook.com slash DrNerdLove. And as always, hit that logo to subscribe, check out my other videos, and I will see you here next time with more about love, sex, and dating. Later!